doctoral student in uh, ASU University in the US. And currently he is a faculty in ISER Bhopal. And uh, apart from being an excellent researcher, Dr. Rayana is also a wonderful human being, I have to say this. And he's done a lot of work, social service, work with villagers in the outskirts of Bangalore, in the Kumuduvati River Reju Reju Rejuvenation Project. And he's, uh, apart from his area of expertise, quantum computing, he's also taught a lot of meditation and yoga workshops to people from uh, all walks of society. So therefore, I truly believe that he's well qualified to present such an abstract subject as uh, quantum computing in a simple and engaging manner so that even uh, most of the students who have joined here can benefit. So without further delay, let me invite Dr. Ankuraina. Please, sir, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anusia, for uh, giving such a warm introduction. Uh, you made my day, and I hope this will be uh, a, a good talk and uh, it will you know, spark some interest among the uh, audience. Uh, so I will start sharing my screen. Uh, let me know if it is you are able to see uh, the presentation. Um, OK, uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we are able okay. to see your screen. Very good. OK, so this will be the outline of uh, the talk today. Uh, we, I will cover why quantum uh, is relevant. Why do we need to uh, you know, worry about the quantum realm? Uh, and I'll consider uh, a very famous experiment called the double slit experiment. Then there are some applications. Uh, we'll see if we get time uh, in this talk. Um, and I'll keep it you know, very basic. So if we get time, we'll cover the super dense coding teleportation and the a curious example of a measurement. Uh, so let me just begin why uh, quantum is relevant. You know, if you see uh, the way the, uh, you know, the devices uh, these days, the uh, storage devices, the hard disk, the, uh, you know, the other uh, pen drives, etc. The way uh, the information density is increasing uh, and the number of transistors are almost doubling every uh, you know, 18 months uh, by Moore's law, you can see uh, that uh, you don't, you know the channel that needs to be etched on the uh, on the uh, wafer or uh, that chip is getting you know smaller and smaller. And in the near future, by maybe around 2030 or 2530, we don't know, close to around 2030, uh, the the storage density density is going to be so high that we are going to enter the quantum realm. Uh, what I mean is the storage is going to become, uh, you know, like you would want to store information uh, at the size of the atom. So at that level, the classical Boolean laws no longer hold. What are the classical Boolean laws? So you say if, uh, you know, if the log, if the voltage or some, you know, current or entity is above a certain threshold, you call it one. The logical one, and if it is below a certain threshold, you call it a zero, a logical zero, right? But these kind of laws are not possible when you enter the realm of the atom. You know, the part, the particles are so small, the atoms are so small that the uh, Boolean laws, the classical Boolean laws, no longer hold, and we have to inevitably enter the quantum realm. And now we have to sort of obey or adhere to the quantum laws, the new laws now, right? You are, for example, if you go from one country to another country, you have to follow the traffic rules, etc. Right? You have to follow or you adhere to the new rules, new realm, uh, so to speak. So in this way, uh, why quantum is relevant is because by 25 or 2030, uh, the, the information density is going to be so high that you're going to hit the atom. You know, the type of measure, uh, the type of uh, storage is going to be uh, of the order of the atoms. And that is why the quantum needs to be taken seriously. Uh, and uh, with this uh, kind of a background, I'll start the double slit experiments, a very famous experiment and a very mind bo boggling experiment, which was done uh, very, uh, you know, uh, almost a century back. Uh, and you must have studied this in, in your, uh, you know, 12th standard uh, or equivalent. Um, so th this is done by Young. Uh, Young, he considered a light source and he passed it through uh, two slits and there is a screen. 
now you see on the screen uh, there are these interference patterns. You know, there's a darker patch and there's a brighter spot and the intensity itself is varying. On the center, the the you know the, on the screen, the brightest spot is uh, present and as you go away from the center, you see uh, you know the intensity is dropping. So uh, to make sense of this kind of an observation, uh, what was uh, you know what was the explanation? What was given was that you know there is this interference happening between uh, the light waves. So wherever there is constructive interference, there is a brighter spot, and wherever there is destructive interference, there is a dark patch on the screen. So everything was smooth, and then the the curiosity in a scientist makes us do more experiments, right? And later on, after some years uh, of young, there were other set of scientists who did uh, the experiment. They repeated with uh, the electron gun. OK, so now instead of considering the light, they uh, started you know, shooting electrons. And the experiment setup is exactly the same. And now also you see that there is an interference pattern observed on the screen. Normally, if you see a particle or if, for example, if you're throwing cricket balls, uh, you know, consider two doors and you're just throwing cricket balls, you will uh, you, you will expect the cricket balls to accumulate behind the doors, right? And that was also the intuitive uh, understanding of the electrons. The electron is a particle and then if you shine um, electrons on the double slit behind the two slits, you would expect the electrons to create these patterns. On. Yeah, or uh, you know patches, but contrary to this, what was observed was an interference pattern, uh, and the explanation was now uh, given by uh, the de Broglie principle, where uh, you can make sense of the wave nature of a particle uh, by invoking that that even particles have a wave nature and they have a certain wavelength. So the particle, which is the electron here, also is behaving like a wave, and wherever there is constructive interference, you expect or you see um, a, a pattern where there is higher intensity. OK. Now you would uh, you know this is something very, <laughs> very weird, right? Uh, there's an electron, it's a particle, but then what does it mean that what is this interference all, all, all about? So what they did was they said, Let, let's do something different now. Let's see which slate the electron goes through. OK, and then they placed uh, a camera so or some such device which can capture or catch the electron going through the slits. So they placed a camera in front of the uh, you know the uh, the sheet you know that uh, the slits to catch the electron. Now what happens is uh, the experiment outcome is totally different. Now it starts behaving like a particle. So the moment the camera was placed in front of the slits to catch the electrons, the experimental outcome completely changed. The, part, the electrons started behaving like, the electrons started behaving like a particle. So uh, now you, what you observe is uh, that there is a bunch of electrons getting collected behind the two slits. It is behaving exactly like the cricket balls example that I mentioned. So this is something totally different. Right? This is so weird. The moment I try to interfere in, interfere or sort of meddle with the experiment by introducing there is a there is an observer who is trying to do something uh, by observing uh, the experiment, the experimental outcome changes, right? So this is something totally counterintuitive and not at all expected uh, in the classical world. For example, if you're trying to measure the resistance of a resistor, you do not change the resistance. Right? But here, by direct intervention of the observer or the experimenter who is doing the experiment, the experimental outcome is changing. And so this is something to uh, you know, uh, start making you believe that something really weird uh, phenomena is happening at the quantum realm. And that is why we need to adhere or respect the quantum laws to, if we have to uh, you know, process information in the new realm. Now, how do we make sense? Like phys talking uh, in a plain language, plain English, you can say that the uh, 
the in the experiment when there is no camera placed in in the way when the electron is behaving like a part uh, like a like a wave the electron is behaving like a wave the electron is present at the two slates simultaneously and that is why it is interfering with itself so this is totally uh, new and weird uh, and this is mathematically represented uh, as a superposition that the electron is present in the slit one or slit slit one and slit two simultaneously. And how do we write that mathematically is uh, using what are what is invented by Dirac and we'll come to that uh, soon. So essentially what is happening is the electron is present in the both in both slits simultaneously and we need a language to express. So when Newton invented uh, you know, like calculus to you know uh, give the laws of motion. Uh, he gave some equations, uh, and there's a there's a mathematical language to express what is observed in the nature. Similarly, for quantum uh, phenomena, there is a new sort of a mathematics which was invented by Dirac and a bunch of other scientists to you know to express what is happening at the quantum realm. And that is why uh, that is what brings us to a quantum bit. A quantum bit is different uh, than a classical bit. Now you know the classical bit is represented by a zero or a one. It's a scalar, right? So you have this, let's say a register. Uh, it has flip flops, etc., whatever, and then you have a zero or a one in a register, right? The information is stored in the form of zeros and ones in a register. However, a quantum bit is different. It is represented by vectors now instead of the scalars which is zero or one it is having a vector uh, sort of a vector flavor okay so the zero now is mapped to a vector let's call it one zero the column vector one zero and the one the classical one is mapped to a column vector zero one okay using these kind of a vector notation we are able to map the classical zero or the classical one to the quantum zero or the quantum one in the form of uh, vectors. OK, and we say that the state of a quantum bit is represented using a vector. OK. So essentially a quantum bit is a two level system. OK, it's a vector and the state of a quantum bit is represented by a vector. And we can call these column vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1 as the quantum 0 and quantum 1 represented in this you know, funny uh, notation called the ket 0 and the ket 1. Okay. And any state of a quantum bit is now a linear superposition of a 0 and a 1. So this is exactly what I was referring to when uh, I talked of the electron being present at slit one and slit two simultaneously. How do I represent that mathematically? By saying that it's a linear combination or a superposition of the zero and one. So we have a vector, call it psi. It is essentially the column vector AB, uh, A being the first component, B being the second component. So the vector AB is the state of a quantum bit. And these a comma a and b have a special property that the sum of the mod squares is equal to one. So the state of any quantum bit now can be represented as a linear superposition or a linear combination of zero and one. So it is some a zero plus some b one, and it represents some arbitrary state. So this is exactly something different than a classical zero and a classical one. In a classical uh, you know, domain, uh, you have zero or one stored in a register or a memory device or a magnetic tape or a whatever you consider. However, in quantum, the state is possible to have uh, a combination of zero and one in this form. So essentially the state of a quantum bit is a vector and it is simultaneously zero and one. How do we represent that? We say that it is A times zero plus b times one and uh, mod a square plus mod b square equal to one makes it a unit vector. It is of length one. So 
uh, to just summarize a quantum bit or a qubit is a quantum is the quantum analog of a classical bit. The striking difference is that it allows for the principle of superposition. And here the information is physical. You know the there you are exploiting the quantum mechanical properties of these uh, you know entities. For example, you have the photon or the uh, uh, you know or the spin of a of an uh, of a nucleus, right? So the inform the quantum mechanical properties such as polarization or uh, any such thing can be used to uh, represent the quantum information. So the quantum information is the is the state in some sense, you know, so the state that I talked of, the state psi, which is a vector. Now you can represent or store information of a of the polarization of a photon in the form of uh, using a uh, using a photon. Okay, so this allows us to manipulate information. So I consider the photon is photon is polarized uh, in horizontal or vertical direction. So you can consider the ket zero representing the horizontal polarization and the ket one representing the vertical polarization. So now you are exploiting the quantum mechanical properties. Uh, it's a total new ball game, uh, and you you can do a new new sort of. Uh, you know, processing new kind of uh, you know testing applications etc you can explore using the quantum mechanical properties so it gives a plethora of opportunities i think uh, anusya already talked of, uh, of the op range of uh, opportunities or the applications which are being explored by scientists all over the world uh, namely secrecy communication etc now uh, as i said you know we have to adhere to the new rules new uh, new laws right uh, so these are some of the postulates that were uh, put forward by the scientists um, long back when when they invented quantum mechanics and we will just roughly state them and these have been observed and these have been you know uh, tested these are all uh, Observed, and that is why they come up with these postulates. So you take them as you know uh, for a fact. So as I said, the state space, uh, you know, the st associated to, to any isolated physical system is a Hilbert space. I don't know if people uh, here know what is a Hilbert space. Just think of it as a vector space. So vector space has vectors in it. Like if you have the two-dimensional plane, uh, any vector is a, let's say one comma two or two comma three is a vector and the entire uh, two dimensional plane is a vector space. OK, uh, and here in this uh, quantum mechanical uh, picture, the the vectors are of unit length. So any state psi, let's say, is A0 plus B1 represented by column vector AB and the 0 and 1, the quantum 0 and the quantum 1 are also called as the basis vectors. And these help us to represent any state uh, present in this vector space uh, using, you know, a a zero and b one. Now, how does uh, the state evolve? So, in Newton's picture of uh, laws of motion, there is the position, the momentum that that uh, you know changes. So, if you know the position and momentum at a certain time, what is the position and momentum at later time? So, there are some mathematical equations. Similarly, how does a quantum state evolve? What is a quantum state? It's a vector representing the state of a, uh, of a quantum bit. How does it evolve? So from Schrodinger, Schrodinger's equation, uh, it evolves unitarily. What I mean is you have a state psi at time t1 and you have a psi, you have a state psi dash at a later time t2. The state at time t2 is a unitary evolution of the state at time t1. So this preserves the unitary operation, preserves the length of the vector. So you the input or the starting state is a unit vector. The final state at a later time is also a unit vector. So this property of the unitary evolution uh, sort of you know, uh, preserves the length. So psi dash is some u times psi. And then there's a you know a unique phenomenon called the measurement. The act of measurement changes the state. So the type of measurement you're doing, for example, uh, in in the double state experiment when we were trying to catch the electron uh, using a camera, we were doing some sort of a measurement. 
Similarly, the act of measurement changes the state. So for example, if you have a quantum bit which is in a certain state and you are measuring a certain quantity, let's say you want to measure the momentum, position, polarization, anything, the act of measurement changes the state. So this is completely new or different than the classical where the uh, measurement of the resistance of the resistor does not change the resistance, right? So I'll come to this measurement uh, in a while. Uh, so this is the summary. Uh, a quantum bit is characterized by its state. Quantum bits, you know, should be or can be treated as mathematical objects. What do I mean by mathematical objects? They are some vectors in some vector space and they evolve unitarily. They undergo measurement, so they you know, sort of collapse to new states. They are also uh, after collapse. Also, they are vectors before collapse before the measurement. They are vectors, so, so we are you know dealing or the whole um, language is in terms of vectors. So vector vectors are the inputs, vectors are the outputs, everything in terms of vectors. And uh, the principle of superposition, which allows us to simultaneously talk of zero and one, the classic, uh, the quantum zero and the quantum one, uh, and uh, any state is a linear superposition of the zero and one. Uh, for instance, any state psi is A0 plus B. And is zero one. But this is uh, not um, completely uh, correct, but I just uh, gave you an example of the cat zero and cat one. You can consider other basis states as well. So in this talk, I just you know said, or generally the cat zero represents the column vector one zero and the cat one represents uh, the zero one. So, but you, you are free to choose a different set of basis vectors. Uh, but you know that in a vector space, you have a you have a basis, the and any vector can be represented using these basis states. So you can consider any other different uh, basis states as well. But uh, to keep things simple, we can uh, stick to this uh, A P and the A A times zero plus B times one. Now this is a column vector. The other uh, is the conjugate of it, which is a row vector. You take the conjugate of AB and you get A bar, B bar, the complex conjugate. So for states psi and phi, let's say uh, state psi represents um, qubit one and state phi represents qubit two. Psi times phi is a column vector times row vector. It's a matrix while the the other way, which is this, uh, the conjugate is called as a bra. The bra times the psi is a scalar. Qubit whose state is represented by psi is in superposition of zero and one. And then this is a measurement postulate. What happens is when we try to measure, the state collapses to, uh, you know, one of the basis states of the entity that you're measuring. For example, if you're measuring the state uh, of a qubit. OK, uh, let's say you have uh, the state psi, which is a zero plus B one and you're measuring in what is called as the zero one basis or the Z basis. Uh, the state collapses to state zero with a probability mod A square and it collapses to state one with probability mod B square. So that is why the probabilities have to add up. You cannot get anything else. So mod A square plus mod B square is one. Here we say that we have performed measurement in the cat 01 basis, or we have measured the spin along the z direction. So this is for the physics language, but you need not worry if you, uh, about what is the spin along z direction. Just think of it as measuring in a certain basis, and uh, the the state collapses to one of the basis states. So what is this quantum measurement? Let's elaborate a little bit more. We have a state. Psi representing uh, the state of a quantum bit, and you have a measurement device whose eigenstates are represented by E1, E2 through En. So you have a measurement entity, okay? Uh, for example, you're measuring the spin along the z direction, along the x direction, or you're measuring some other entity. And these entities are uh, represented mathematically as Hermitian matrices. As you know, Hermitian matrices uh, have real eigenvalues. So what you observe is the eigenvalue. So you can think of it as a measuring device. It has, you know, like a 
uh, you know, like an amateur, anything. So there is a needle, okay? And the needle points to the eigenvalues. So if a, if an observable or a, the measurement operator that I'm trying to measure, for example, the spin along the Z direction has uh, certain eigenvalues and what you observe on that needle on that on that measuring device is one of the eigenvalues of that uh, entity that you're measuring. So that entity is a Hermitian operator, so it has real eigenvalues. So the needle always points to one of the eigenvalues. So if you think of uh, an operator or a measurement observable, observable which has eigenvalues E1, E2 through En and having corresponding eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2 through lambda n, you observe on the on the needle pointing to lambda k with probability given by mod psi e k square. And at the end of the measurement, the state would have changed to e k. Okay, if you are observing, if you have observed on that device lambda k, you know that the state has collapsed to e k and the probability of observing that uh, outcome is given by mod of uh, bracket psi e k square. I hope this was clear. Uh, so corresponding to every physical observable, there is a Hermitian matrix. So consider some operator or a matrix O, which is written as summation lambda j uh, in the sket e j bra e j. So this is the spectral decomposition of every Hermitian operator. You can write in this form. So you observe lambda you, you on the needle, you observe lambda j with certain probability given by uh, mod of psi e k square. And at the end of the measurement, the state would have sort of collapsed to one of the eigenstates of that observable. So suppose you have a state psi and when you measure O, you see lambda k with probability uh, mod bracket psi e k square. And when you see uh, lambda k, the state collapses to the state e k. So from psi, you've gone to e k. If you want to, you know, take that double state experiment as a reference, so it would have collapsed as a particle and you observe the part, the electron uh, getting accumulated either behind the slate one or behind slate two. And this collapse is instantaneous, so it's like <laughs> uh, the moment you try to measure something and uh, the measurement, you observe a certain measurement, the state, is, state collapses instantaneously. Now what happens to multiple quantum bits? So in the classical, you have multiple bits, right? You have, you know, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, etc. So in quantum, the same is possible. You can consider quantum registers where uh, the, the information in registers contains quantum information, that is uh, quant information of quantum bits. Uh, and uh, these these can be thought of as quantum registers where each uh, each register is or each uh, you know <laughs> each block of that register is containing the information of a quantum bit so if for example if you have n equal to 500 quantum bits right you can in parallel do perform computation on 2 to the power 500 numbers that's huge right compared to the classical where uh, you can do no, serially, right? You you can you take something in the register, you do some processing, you change the input, again do the processing, again change the input, do the processing, like in a microprocessor, right? So information in the register, you can uh, do something based on the information in the register, right? However, in quantum, you can do everything, all of this in parallel. That's huge. Just 500 quantum bits. Imagine, you can play around with 200. 2 to the power of 500 numbers. That's an exponential uh, power in in performance, uh, or so, or let me not <laughs> say performance uh, in in terms of the computation. Now, but there's a catch. You can do 2 to the power of 500 number processing at a time, but essentially you will have to perform measurement. And when you perform measurement uh, on these 500 qubits, you will essentially end up getting 500 numbers. So the what is uh, you can think of it as a quantum, you know, computer or a processor which does, you know, number number crunching, uh, you know, computations, and then at the end of the computation, do a measurement, 
and you get a classical value and you essentially get 500 classical values at the end of the measurement. So this is the catch, even though the processing or the compute number of computation that you can perform is huge, but essentially when you have to uh, do measurement, it collapses to the classical picture. Uh, so the major challenge now for quantum algorithms is to modify the probability distribution of the measurement results in such a way that the requested uh, or the desired uh, result of qu uh, quantum computation will be obtained with high probability. You can think of it as, you know, a uh, 200, you know, let's say 500 quantum bits and you're doing uh, processing or, you know, parallel uh, computation on these uh, 500 qubits and you want to have a uh, an algorithm which gives you a desired result with highest probability. So you you expect you put an input and you expect a certain outcome, but you want to tweak this uh, algorithm. You want to tweak this quantum circuit in such a way you get uh, the desired outcome with highest probability. So that is the challenge. So that is the essentially the picture that uh, we we can take uh, away from uh, you know this talk. Uh, the state of uh, multiple quantum bits resides in a space obtained by tensor product of individual spaces. So I said uh, the Hilbert space or the vector space that I was talking of. A quantum bit is present uh, in a in a vector space. It's a complex vector space where you had a comma b, right? Uh, two um, two components of a vector, and it's the complex vector space. So if you have two qubits, it will be a tensor product of these two vector spaces. So complex vector space, tensored, complex vector space, tensored, as many number of quantum bits. So the state of all the quantum bits together is given by the tensor product, or sometimes people call chronic chronicer product of the individual states. So you have a state psi1 representing the state of a quantum bit one, psi2 representing the state of quantum bit two, psi n representing the state of quantum bit n. The total state is given by the tensor product of individual quantum states. And typically for quantum bits, the Hilbert space, as I said, is a complex vector space C2, where a comma b uh, are complex numbers and the state of a quantum bit is represented by uh, a vector in this vector space. Uh, so let's consider an example. Let's say you have two quantum bits. One quantum bit is representing uh, psi one, which is a one zero plus b one one, and you have another quantum bit whose state is psi two, which is equal to a two zero plus b two one. Now, what happens if I want to uh, calculate the the state of two qubits together? You know? For that, we do the Kronecker product or uh, the tensor product tensor product of a10 plus b11 times a20 plus b21. So if you see a1 and a2 is getting multiplied and then you have 0 times 0, the cat 0 times cat 0, which is actually the tensor product. And then you have a1 times b2 times cat 0, cat 1. And then you have b1, a2, which is cat 1 times cat 0. And b1, b2, Represent uh, multiplied by cat one times cat one. So when I said zero times zero, it's a tensor product or the Kronecker product. So zero tensor zero is now the tensor product of the column vectors. So you had zero represented by column vector one zero, and then you have another zero, okay, another cat zero representing uh, the column vector one zero. When you multiply the two, you get the column vector one zero zero zero, and then you have the column vector 0 1 0 0 that is uh, the that is representing the cat 0 1 and then you have cat 1 0 which is equal to the 0 0 1 0 the column vector and then you have cat 1 1 uh, representing the column vector 0 0 0 1 now you see essentially now we have a new vector space which is c4 or c2 tensor c2 and now we have four numbers you have a1, a2, a1, b2, b1, a2, b1, b2. So by considering two qubits, the numbers have doubled. So if you have three qubits, you will have eight numbers. If you have 500 qubits, you will have two to the power of 500 numbers. That is where 
uh, the exponential uh, property or the exponential processing is possible. So what you do, do essentially in quantum algorithms is you work with basis states. So for example, you have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 representing the basis states of this new vector space C4. You, you check or you do some uh, processing on these basis states and any uh, state can be represented by a linear combination of these basis states. So you in in process, I mean you can uh, process the information in parallel on these four uh, basis states. Now there's an, a unique phenomenon uh, which is <laughs> uh, very intriguing and uh, which is the reason why uh, quantum is special is a special uh, phenomenon called entanglement and we consider a certain special state called the bell pair. It is a state of two quantum bits. Let's say psi AB represents the state of two quantum bits and uh, it is given by ket0 tensor ket0 plus ket1 tens. I think that I missed a, a tensor there. So uh, ten, uh, one tensor one, okay, which is essentially written in shorthand as 0, 0 plus 1, 1 by root 2. Now suppose uh, these two quantum bits are prepared in this state and uh, you let's say A is the state of I mean the qubit uh, representing the state A is here on Earth and the qubit representing the state B is somewhere else, you know, let's say Pluto. OK, and let's say here on Earth you perform measurement in the 0 1 basis. OK, now what is the outcome? What do you expect when you're measuring in the 0 1 basis? The state of quantum bit A will collapse to 0 1, right? That's that's we have covered. We have seen that when you measure in the 0 1 basis or basically you're considering an observable whose eigenstates are 0 1. When you measure in such a basis, the state will collapse to one of the eigenstates. So it will collapse to either a 0 or a 1. Now what happens when you uh, perform measurement on Earth or here or uh, let's say on system A, the state can collapse to either a 0 or a 1. OK, now what happens is if the state of quantum bit A collapses to a 0, the state of quantum bit, no, no matter how far it is, also collapses to a 0. OK, so by doing something here on Earth, you are able to influence something which is very far, let's say in Pluto. OK, so that is something very weird and <laughs> mind boggling and uh, you know some sort of super luminal communication seems to be happening, violating the special theory of relativity. Einstein called this spooky action at it distance, but uh, if you carefully see there is no communication happening because uh, uh, the measurement outcomes are probabilistic. And uh, it's just the way nature is responding to the measurement. OK, this phenomenon is called entanglement and this is one of the most powerful uh, resources which is uh, present or available to us or given by nature uh, to all the scientists, all the researchers to use and exploit uh, for information processing. OK, so this is something uh, we, you might want to uh, be very uh, mindful of that, you know, no matter how far they are, uh, you know, you can influence the state of an entity B, which is far away, by doing something to uh, the entity at A. I hope that was clear, and uh, this is uh, very, very weird and one of the reasons um, you know quantum is popular and now we'll just uh, you know i think what is the time left uh, you have okay we have uh, 20 minutes so i'll just cover a little bit uh, how much ever is possible uh, maybe in 15 minutes and then maybe uh, should I, how much time do we have for the questions uh, anusia what time should i end you can take the whole uh, time after that we can have five minutes of question okay so we'll have 20 minutes okay so you know you have you have, you have classical gates you have no uh, nand gate nor gate or gate all kinds of gates right where which uh, do processing on the classical zeros and ones similarly in quantum 
now we have to talk of vectors, right? Because the vectors are the quantum analogs of the classical zeros and ones. You have quite ket zero, you have ket one, you have the vectors, and uh, you need some new kind of a gate which does processing on these uh, these vectors. So what happens when you have a vector and you want to do something on the vector? What will you use? You you use matrices, all right? And these matrices are representing the quantum gates. And what kind of matrices should we consider? These gates should be essentially unitary because you want to preserve the length of uh, the vectors. So these quantum gates are essentially uh, unitary vectors. So for example, you have an n qubit state uh, and uh, you want to operate on this n qubit state and you have an operator, uh, a unitary operator, which is of size 2 power n by 2 power n. Uh, you in general need not, need not be a tensor product of uh, matrices of smaller size. However, if it is, let's say it is equal to the tensor product. Let's say u is equal to u0 tensor u1 tensor un minus 1. And then you have uh, a vector, a, um, you know, representing the state of n qubits, uh, you know, given by i0 tensor i1 tensor in minus 1. The action of the unitary u on these n qubits can now be written as the action on individual uh, states. You know, u0 acting on i0, u1 acting on i1, un minus 1 acting on in minus 1. However, if it is not of this form, then the total unitary you have to consider in a whole, and then the split is not possible. You'll have to consider the whole state i0, i1, in minus 1. Uh, you know, it's a two to the n column vector, and the unitary acts on the huge new vector, and you will have to uh, evolve the state accordingly. Now, are there some standard quantum gates? Okay, yes. Uh, similar to the classical, we have the uh, where we have the OR gate, AND gate, NAND gate, all that. We have quantum gates, namely Hadamard gate. So you can quickly check this Hadamard gate. H is a unitary gate. Uh, given by 1 by root 2, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. And what does it do? Uh, it has to, uh, you know, um, act on the information, which is the ket 0, ket 1. So it has to act on the vectors. When the Hadamard acts on the ket 0, you get a superposition array or a uniform superposition of 0 and 1. So you have a new state now. And when it acts on the state 1, you get 0 minus 1 by root 2. So you have a column vector. Uh, zero going to a new column vector and you have a, a column vector one which is going to a new column vector. So essentially vectors are going to vectors and this uh, you know transformation is represented by this unitary matrix H. And there is another uh, analog of the not gate uh, in quantum, namely the Pauli X gate or the quantum not gate. What does it do in the classical? You have if you input zero to a not gate, you get one. If you input one to a not gate, you get zero. Similarly, in the quantum, uh, the quantum not gate or the Pauli X gate takes the ket zero to a ket one. So what does it mean? The column vector represented by zero is getting transformed to a new column vector represented by one. And similarly, the column vector uh, representing the ket1 is going to a new column vector representing the ket0. Zero. So 0 going to 1, 1 going to 0 in the quantum language. And uh, there are some additional gates uh, which is not there in the uh, classical. There is no phase kind of a concept in classical where 0, zero gets mapped to you know, either a one or a zero itself, but here there's a phase, uh, the idea of a phase. That's where the quantum mechanical properties are, uh, you know, kicking in. So zero is going to a zero. What does it mean? The column vector zero is getting transformed to a column vector zero. So there is no change. Uh, and the column vector one is getting transformed to minus. Um, so there's a phase addition of a minus one on that uh, vector. Right. So why are we interested uh, or uh, working with, um, you know, these kind of only zeros and ones? 
you may wonder why why are we interested on uh, on the action of uh, the kids on the on the action of gates on ked zero on the action of the gates on ked one because these ked zeros and ked ones are the basis states when we know what is the action on the basis states we know the action on any arbitrary state because psi is any state psi is a linear combination of 0 and 1 so if you know the action on the basis states you know the action on any arbitrary state okay and there well, there's one more gate called the uh, y gate and uh, it maps again as i said column vectors to column vectors and the ket zero is getting mapped to a i times 1 so i is the uh, imaginary uh, square root of square root uh, and the one is getting mapped to a minus i zero so essentially column vectors are getting mapped to column vectors and uh, we have these four gate uh, we have these four gates uh, and the identity matrix the x gate the y uh, z gate and the y gate together these four gates uh, can represent any r uh, any unitary so this this also forms a basis uh, in the matrix uh, vector space so if you have any unitary you can write that as a linear combination of the identity matrix the x matrix the z matrix and the y matrix so this is another um, nice way uh, to you know sort of decompose any unitary and if you know the action of uh, these matrices, these basis matrices, which is I identity, the X, Z and Y, then you know the action of any arbitrary unitary uh, on any state. So both ways we are using basis states uh, for for in the first case, which is the state of quantum bits. You have the ket zero ket one, uh, the basis states um, spanning the vector space uh, of uh, you know the states where all these um, all these quantum bits lie and on the other hand we have operators uh, also represented by linear combination of these basis uh, matrices uh, namely identity the x the z and the y okay uh, now in classical also you have two two bit gates right you have your nand gate nor gate all that uh, similar to that we have the quantum not uh, the controlled uh, not get okay so what happens is again again here the uh, column vectors are getting mapped to column vectors and there's a uh, nice way uh, to see this uh, there's a control qubit and there's a target qubit so if the control qubit is one uh, what i mean is if the control qubit is in the state uh, ket one then you uh, apply a not get on the target qubit okay uh, so for example um, what does this mean if you have a ket 0 ket 0 it get gets mapped to ket 0 ket 0 and if you have input ket 0 ket 1 it gets mapped to ket 0 ket 1 so no change however if the input is now ket 1 ket 0 what is it what does it do the first the control gate is now in the state ket 1 so it will flip the target qubit so if the input was ket 1 ket 0 the output is ket 1 ket 1 Similarly, if the input is ket1, ket1, it will flip the second qubit. So the output will be ket1, ket0. So that you can see uh, here. So here it is acting like identity, and here it is acting like a flip. So the flip happens only when the, the first quantum bit or the control qubit is in the state of ket1. Similarly, you have uh, uh, you have another two qubit gate, namely the control phase gate, uh, control Z gate or the control phase gate. Uh, here you apply a, a phase of minus one when both qubits are in the state ket one. So you have, when we have the control qubit also uh, in uh, ket one and the target qubit also in the ket one, then you apply a minus one to the overall state. So that we can see here. So it acts like an identity for uh, the states ket0, 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 ket1, ket1, ket0. However, it applies a state, uh, applies a phase of minus one on the state ket1, ket1. So when the input is ket1, ket1, the output is a minus one times ket1, ket1. 
Now, there are some challenges uh, that are on the way. Uh, these are called uh, the so-called no-go theorems, which are sort of for uh, the theorems are which tells us what is forbidden in quantum, right? So we have the rules, what is possible, and there are certain rules which uh, which say what is forbidden, which is not possible in the quantum. So both needs to be known, right? When we are entering the quantum realm, we need to know what is possible, what is not possible. Okay, and what is not possible is cloning. Now, what does it mean? Now, what does it mean? It means that there is no copying. You cannot copy. For example, if I have a, a state psi and I want to copy it uh, into another uh, quantum register uh, and I can, you know, and I, I conceive or I think of a unitary operator which takes uh, this state psi and a zero and you get psi times psi, that is forbidden. You cannot clone uh, quantum bits and what I mean is there exists no unitary which can uh, copy the state of quantum bits onto uh, new new quantum registers. So because there is no copying, you cannot broadcast. You cannot send the same quantum uh, information. You cannot send the same state to two different parties. You cannot broadcast them because copying is not allowed. And there's another uh, theorem called the no deletion theorem. Now, what does it mean is uh, you cannot delete uh, the information. For example, if you have you cannot think of a, uh, a unitary which takes psi times some phi and you get psi times zero. So in some sense you're deleting that information. Uh, that is not possible. So this is something which is weird and <laughs> you know like co very counterintuitive to the classical where you can just copy. You know uh, you just take your pen drive just copy from one place to another, right? That kind of a copying is not possible. And also deletion where you just press the but button delete. Uh, you cannot delete the quantum information. Uh, what I mean is there exists no such unitary which can clone or copy the information. There exists no unitary which can delete the information. Now what are certain of uh, certain applications that we can think of? OK, I think uh, we are just five minutes. I'll just I think conclude with this slide uh, with this application. OK, uh, so let's think of uh, one of the applications. Um, here uh, uh, using the bell pair. So this entanglement where that is talked of, talked of, right? Uh, one of the very, you know, very intriguing uh, phenomenon which is present in quantum is that of entanglement. Uh, let's say we want to create a secret key. OK, I want to inform send information from this place to another place and I am communicating over a classical channel uh, or a classical you know, communication channel and I want to keep the information secret. So I will use a secret key. I will put that uh, on top of my information and send it and at the decoder or the one who is sort of sort of decrypting the information, he will use the same secret key to decrypt. So we are sort of sharing the same key between two parties. How do we do that? So suppose now there are n bell pairs. So we have the bell pair uh, which is represented by ket 0 0 plus ket 1 1 by root 2. And now think of n such bell pairs come uh, shared between parties a and b. Suppose a starts measuring qubits in the 0 1 basis. So what does a get at the end of the measurement? A gets uh, you know n such uh, collapses, right? The state of uh, the state of qubits at a will collapse to a zero or a one with certain with with a probability half. So you can either get a zero or a one when you are doing measurement. So let's say a, la a ran random string s, which is an n bit string uh, corresponding to the measurement outcomes obtained by a, is available at a. So I hope this is clear. What I'm doing is we have we have uh, we have n such bell pairs shared between a and b. One half of the bell pair is with A, the other half of the bell pairs here are with B, and A is measuring these n quantum bits available at A. And A measures these qubits in the 0 1 basis. Okay, so because of quantum measurement uh, principle, A can get 0 or 1 with, with probability half. You can either get 0 or you get 1. So you can get a random string uh, at A because of the measurement. 
OK, now what happens because of entanglement is if B also performs measurement, he's also going to get the same string that uh, that A obtained. So both of them are now able to share the same string S. No matter uh, how far they are, OK? Whatever A does, B also gets the same, OK? So in that way, they are able to share the same string S. Now, if I want to use this as a secret key, and uh, there's, this, you know, there's this application called a one-time pad, so if I want to send information X, what I will do is I'll encrypt X as X, X XOR S. So I'm doing a XOR operation, bitwise uh, XOR operation, of the information X and the string S. So I'll encrypt this information and send to uh, B. What B does is B decrypts. So B gets X plus S and B is having the string S. So B uh, does X uh, tensor S is what B got. And now B performs another uh, XOR operation on what he or she receives, so you get X. So what happens is um, A and B are now able to communicate secretly using this string S that is obtained from quantum mechanical uh, ideas, and uh, both of them are now able to share the same secret key. So uh, with this, I think it's a good time to uh, finish the talk, uh, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed this. And uh, if there are, if there's time for questions, uh, we can take it now. Any any questions from the participants? Um, anybody can they can unmute, no sir? No, sir. Uh, okay, I I have just one question. So, uh, as you initially talked about the double slit experiment and the De Broglie experiments, and uh, as far as I remember, see, I I I'm not in touch with quantum domain at all. So correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but the the reason why we have a change in state when we are trying to measure at the level of an electron or you know at the level of an atom is because any measurement requires an input of uh, some entity into that particular state and that input PHC, if you want to see something you need light that particular say if you give the example of a cricket ball or something if that is moving if there is no light at all i will not be able to see it and if I want to see it, then I have to either hear or I have to actually put some light there. And at the level of a cricket ball, it's so hard and so huge that the light is not going to change its tra trajectory. However, in the case of you know the quantum domain that you're talking about, any input, any disturbance to the system itself changes the outcome of the system. This is how I understood uh, uh, you know, the deep Broglie experiment uh, and maybe I, I don't know whether that's a partial understanding or not. Uh, in, in the same way, is there some sense we can make of this uh, quantum entanglement uh, phenomena? How is it that uh, the, the sense of distance does not matter? And the second thing is you're saying that it cannot be that the, the don'ts is that you cannot copy a state, but Yet you're changing a state in one place and in another place, as far as Pluto, that state is getting changed automatically. Can that not be connected to another state which is also changing automatically and this way we cannot send uh, quantum information? Copy okay. more than okay, 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 okay. Uh, very good points, Anusia. Uh, so coming to uh, the first uh, point that you made uh, is where we'll have to influence or send some light. That is exactly what I was referring to is if you want to catch the electron, you will have to uh, 
let's say send in send photon because you want to catch the electron. So think of the electron here and the photon is hitting the electron, but the moment the photon hits the electron and gets back to uh, your you know your vision, the electron has changed. So there is an interaction uh, between yeah. the photon and the electron. That's exactly what is happening. And these particles are so subtle that the mere uh, you know shining of the light on the electron changes the position. So what you measured is not the correct uh, position of the electron because the position of the electron was here, but the moment uh, the photon hit the electron and came back, the electron has moved or gone somewhere else. So there is an uncertainty in the position and uh, it's connected to the uncertainty principle. That's exactly what you, uh, that exactly what you uh, said. That is the reason there is, uh, there's the particles are so subtle and uh, you know they're so sensitive, uh, unlike the cricket ball. So the light itself is not able to change the trajectory of the cricket ball, but however, it is possible to change the trajectory of the electron. So that's one point. Uh, number two, uh, that you talked of is uh, the entanglement phenomenon of entanglement is uh, you know it's a mathematical uh, 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 you know proof that uh, doing something here uh, influences I mean the system A whatever you do on system A you are able to influence system B okay that's like a mathematical proof and it has been observed uh, or uh, you know like uh, demonstrated in in like actual experiments that whatever you do on system A, you're able to influence the system B. And coming to the third point, uh, whether this collapses uh, is is the same as uh, the no cloning. Is it the same? Is it violating uh, or is it uh, what is happening? So as I said, uh, there exists no such unitary which can uh, map arbitrary quantum states. So in the example that we have considered, the ket zero and ket one are the basis states, okay, and they're orthogonal. You can do this kind of a cloning on orthogonal or the basis states, but not on any arbitrary state. So, uh, what I mean by any arbitrary state is some psi, which is some a zero plus b one. So, it is some column vector a b. You cannot clone that a b, okay. Uh, that kind of a cloning is not possible, but uh, if you consider just the control not gate, right, uh, where we gave one zero as the input and it gave one one, right? So you can say that copying is happening, but that copying is restricted to these kind of basis states or orthogonal states. Zero and one are orthogonal. Uh, this kind of copying is uh, restricted to these kind of basis states, not on arbitrary quantum states. Arbitrary, I mean psi equal to a zero plus b one. So a b copying, getting copied to another a b, that is forbidden. I hope that is uh, that is that answers your question. That that's clear. Thank you so much. I think that uh, if there is any more questions, any questions? Uh, I think not, Doctor Uncle. Uh, Uncle. Uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Uh, Rajit Kumar to give the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Rajit Kumar, sir. Can you please? Am I audible, ma'am? Hello? Am I yes, yes, you're audible. So, thank you so much, ma'am. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks for this special occasion. So, I would like to mention my deep sense of appreciation for expert speaker Dr. Rena for his wonderful talk on fundamentals of quantum computing. So thank you, sir, for taking out your valuable time from your busy schedule. All the points started from basic theories. Uh, so that is double, double slit experiment, qubits, multiple qubits, entanglement, etc. were really informative. So thank you for enlightening us with your knowledge and providing us the deep insights of quantum computing. So I want to thank you, our principal sir, Professor J.B.R. Ravindra, and HOD sir, Professor Asif, for giving us the formal permission for conducting this online webinar. Uh, thank you, our coordinators of IEEE PES chapter, VC, Professor N. Kariyappa sir, and Dr. Praveen sir. Thank you, Dr. Anusuya Bhattacharya ma'am, for inviting Dr. Rena as a resource person or expert. And at the last, thank you, participants, for being the part of this wonderful session. We'll meet again with some new and informative learnings. 
by this we are ending this session thank you thank you so much thank you thank you for uh, those words thank you dr anusuya for uh, having this session and i uh, thank the ieee chapter uh, for having this talk and uh, i wish you success lot of success uh, hope you hope you grow uh, in all all forms thank you so much thank you sir